Alex Velez Green, welcome to Hidden Forces. Hey, thanks, Dimitri, for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to have you on, Alex. So uh, for those in our audience who aren't familiar with you, just give us a, a high-level background of who you are and what it is that you do exactly. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I, I a national security hand here in Washington, uh, came up first in, in the, the think tank world, doing a lot of research, focusing particularly on the United States and Russia uh, and, and our relationship, particularly the role of nuclear weapons and emerging technologies in that. Um, after that, I spent some time in the defense industry where I was supporting the Department of Defense on nuclear modernization, but also on uh, implementing the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which was uh, in many regards, a revolutionary document in terms of focusing the department and the country on China, really, uh, for the first time. Um, and then after that, I, I went to Capitol Hill, where I was for the last several years, working for Senator Josh Hawley on the Armed Service Committee, uh, ultimately as his national security advisor. And in that capacity, um, you know, all the the things that you sort of read about in the headlines, uh, you know, those are the kinds of issues that we worked on. And throughout all of that, my focus uh, on his behalf was really figuring out what 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 does it take above all to deter China? Um, what does that mean for our forces? What does it mean for Taiwanese forces? What does it mean for others in the region? And then importantly, what does that mean for what we need to do in other regions so that we can we can uh, uh, satisfy our, our highest priority out there in the Indo-Pacific? So that's sort of been the focus of my efforts now for quite some time. Uh, and now, of course, I'm at the Heritage Foundation, continuing to work on that, those, those similar issues, um, and uh, excited to be here to talk to you about them. So I know you, I mean, you've co-authored stuff with Elbridge Colby in the past. Elbridge was on the podcast before. He's the author of Strategy of Denial, and he led the effort to put together the 2018 NDS. Is that when you guys started to, when you guys first met each other? Does it go back to then, or did you guys know each other before that? So, so Bridge is, is a dear friend and, and a great mentor and and once boss, actually. So we worked, I worked for Bridge back at the Center for a New American Security uh, starting in 2015. Um, so that was a I want to, I'm going to get my math wrong, but it was at least a couple of years before he went into the department. Um, and then when he went in, uh, I was still at CNAS. And when I went to industry, I was supporting implementation of exactly, as you said, the document that he led the development of. So one last question, probably just one last question about background. What is it that led you to have an interest in this area? You said, I think you started with a, an interest in U.S.-Russia relations. What What is the sort of, what what is the driving animus behind your interest in this field? Sure. So I grew up in New York, uh, just north of the city. Um, 9-11 was was a really uh, big, big event for me, obviously, for everyone around us. Mm. Um, and when when I think about where I first became interested in military affairs, and national defense, I think it was it was definitely around that time. And, and I think that really was the motivating factor. So I've been interested in these issues for as long as I can remember. I came up uh, initially training as a, as a Middle East hand, spent time in the region, even, even as I was focusing and you know, really trying to better understand how states use um, war and military coercion to advance their interests. Um, and again, that that's just sort of been a passion of mine for a very, very long time. Um, coming to D.C., you know, shifting gears to focus more on Russia uh, was when I really started to, to marry those longtime interests and studies and, and, and travels and all the rest with kind of the, the current debate. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of just gone from there. And then just one thing I'd, I'd, I'd add is, you know, I, I had this sense before I got to Washington, but certainly after I came to Washington, it became clear that, that many of the sort of prevailing, um, consensuses or, or, or ways of thinking of things just, just didn't seem adequate to the times. You saw that in the Middle East, it was evident, you know, uh, well before we pulled out of Afghanistan, that that was a really problematic endeavor. And yet we persisted, um, and, and similar sort of illogics appeared in other aspects of our national strategy. And so, you know, from a, from a strictly substantive perspective, I, I've always been passionate about this, but um, especially after I arrived in Washington, it became clear to me that this might be a place where, you know, I could, working with others like Bridge and, and, and like my colleagues here at Heritage, make a difference because there is, I think, a real need um, for a new way of thinking about a lot of these issues and how we approach them. You know, I really like, I also, I mean, I've never spent time with Bridge in person, but what I like about him and others like him is that he's mission-driven. And I think that's what we need. In, I mean, that's what we need, period, in general, when it comes to public service. But boy, do we need that now. So even if you don't agree with his assessment or his priorities, at least you know he's focused on the mission and he has an idea of what that mission is. So in the second hour, I want to talk about um, – well, we're going to touch on grand strategy now. But I want to talk about the evolution of grand strategy because your reference of 9-11 just made me think about it again. In fact, you know, we're a few days away. This We're recording this on Thursday, September 14th. So 9-11 was a few days ago. 
the anniversary. And I was in New York City at the time, too. I lived below Canal Street. Actually, my building was my bed was shaken from the first explosion. And for months we lived below the barricade. You know, we would smell the chemicals and everything else that would come out of the rubble. So it was a really traumatic experience. And I haven't really watched coverage from that period or anything. And I actually recently watched the movie of um, with that Dick Cheney movie where uh, he was played by, I forget yep. the guys, the actor who also played um, the other character in the big short. And um, that got me to starting to watch 9-11 footage. And I was struck by a couple of things. One was just the objectivity of the coverage at the time. I mean, literally, uh, Brian Gumbel was sitting there watching the second tower. He watched the second tower collapse. And for 10 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, they didn't, they didn't say it collapsed. They just said a piece came off. We can't validate if the other. I was just fascinated by that. But the other thing I was fascinated about also was just reflecting on how different the country was at that time and the power of the United States. And I think in many ways, many Americans, although that has started to change, still view American power and American in the capacity for power projection of the United States in terms similar to what it was when it was a unipolar power. And so that's, you know, that's something that I would like to talk about. And again, the, the Middle East and the strategic focus on the Middle East for so many years and what that did in terms of making it difficult for us to focus on the challenge that you and Bridge identify, which is China. So let's talk about China. Um, as I've said, you've written a lot about this in public, and I actually have linked to all of those writings in the rundown for this episode, in the intelligence report for this episode. In a recent article in The National Interest, you write in the opening paragraph that, quote, policymakers often assume the United States can deter China from invading Taiwan or win if deterrence fails, but that is no longer a safe assumption. Indeed, it is very possible that the United States will be unable to deter China for the remainder of this decade. Worse still, there is a real chance the People's Liberation Army will be able to defeat U.S. forces in a fight over Taiwan. Can you elaborate on this opinion and specifically explain to us, to, to me and to our audience, what has changed that makes our operating assumptions about America's ability to deter Chinese invasion of Taiwan no longer valid? Yeah, sure thing, Dimitri. And honestly, it's it's I think connected uh, in large measure to your second observation about sort of reflecting on nine eleven. There's a uh, certainly in Washington, and, and to I think I, I would say pro I think a lesser degree outside of Washington, but still throughout the country, there's often been this sense that um, Charles Krautheimer uh, coined the phrase uh, "unipolar moment," right? But there there has been this sense. Um, certainly, Washington acts like. Um, it, it was not going to be just a moment. It's going to be, you know, an eternity. There was, there's no sort of expectation of the diminishment of U.S. power as we left that that sort of, you know, situation of unipolarity and returned to something much more like the bipolarity we saw of the Cold War, which is where we are now. And so, you know, we're we're just simply not as powerful as we used to be um, relative to 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 our competitors in, in broad terms. Now, when we think about the the situation with China in particular. This is a particularly um, frustrating and humbling and, and daunting um, challenge because it, it, in some ways, encapsulates you know just just how far we've come from that that height. Um, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, has obviously made uh, bringing Taiwan under the mainland's control a top priority for a very long time, and they've worked towards that fairly assiduously for a very long time. The military domain. They have invested very, very heavily in all aspects of the People's Liberation Army and supporting entities that are not necessarily strictly military forces, but became rolled into a campaign. Um, and you know, we can talk about some of the payoffs there, but but in in, in broad terms, obviously China's a large country. They have a very large military, it's very close to Taiwan, but but it's not just the size or the proximity, it's the fact that they're increasingly good. Chinese forces are increasingly capable. And there's something that many Americans, including policymakers, don't know about. And oftentimes when you're, they're told about it, they don't like to accept it. It feels almost like a, there's cognitive dissonance to consider the fact that maybe the, those those Chinese pilots or those Chinese um, you know, service combatants, that they, they could in fact be quite formidable from a qualitative perspective, but they are getting very good. And you know, it's, it hasn't been news. There are folks in Washington in particular who have raised the flag now for many years, but they have just not been heated. Uh, and as a result, the United States has consistently failed to invest adequately in the kinds of things that we should have been investing to and now absolutely must invest in um, if we are going to convince Xi Jinping and his lieutenants um, that that he is not going, in fact, to be able to take Taiwan. And that's sort of the harder deterrence. If we want to be able to deter China, 
through you know the best strategy available, which is what Bridges sort of coined as the strategy of denial, this is deterrence by denial. The way to do that is you convince the CCP leadership, not just, just that an invasion is going to be costly, but it's going to fail. It's just it's just not going to work. Um, and so, you know, that that's really kind of the the goal here. Um, and uh, and we're unfortunately we're playing catch up in many regards to get there. We don't time is not an ally in this regard. Yeah, I also want to remind listeners that we have a related section on the episode page for for this episode on our website at hiddenforces.io. And I'm going to have episodes like the episode we've had with Elbridge Colby or with Orville Shell or other experts on China. So definitely check those out if you guys want some further context. So what are the assessments that you, Bridge, and other analysts rely on to make the determination that China has gotten, as you said, good, how, that they've gotten exceedingly good and that they could be in a position to not only not only uh, take control of Taiwan, but actually deliver a defeat to U.S. forces in the Pacific? Sure. Well, well, it starts with you know an understanding. But what what does that mean, right? What does an invasion of Taiwan look like? What would that require of the Chinese, and what would it require of us to defeat that? I mean, the 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 sort of Cliff Notes version of this is you know China has to muster forces, concentrate forces in that that eastern seaboard, send forces out and around Taiwan so they can sort of push U.S. forces back and then concentrate power on Taiwan itself. They've got to be able to suppress Taiwan's defenses, deliver forces to the beaches or by air into the, the island itself. And then they have to be able to consummate, right? They got to keep U.S. forces held back enough so that they can get enough power on that island to seize key terrain and presumably uh, remove the government and, and, and at that point have achieved the fate accompli and taken control. That's a lot to do. Um, but that's the, the military they 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 have they are modernizing and training and exercising to that specific effect. Um for us to stop that, you know, there's there's sort of there's a variety of things. The heart of any effort to prevent China from being able to successfully invade Taiwan has to do with the invasion force. If they cannot deliver enough forces to the island to take control of the island, then they cannot succeed. The the heart of that effort, the center of gravity in sort of traditional terms, is going to be the the invasion fleet and specifically the amphibs required to deliver that number of that kind of capability. Um, so when folks talk about beating an invasion, they start with, OK, we've got to be able to kill a, a large number of these Chinese vessels, accounting for the fact that they'll have decoys and others and not every missile will hit and all the rest. Um, and if we can do that, then we can win. Um, there's more to it, of course, in substantial part, because doing that is really hard. So you've got to plan not just to hit them in the strait. You're going to have to plan it, try and think about hitting them before they get into the strait. You have to plan to fight on the beaches and on the island itself. Um, but that, in, in a nutshell, is kind of what it takes for China to do what it is that it seeks to do and, and for us to prevent it. Now, you know, this is um, this is a, this is a military issue at, at the heart of it when you sort of work through the numbers and you think through, well, what, what will it take to succeed? What will it take to beat them? Um, and, you know, a lot of the sources get classified and that that's what you would expect folks in Department of Defense and OPECOM on the Hill to work on. Um, and, you know, many of the folks involved in this conversation have had experience with that. And that so that informs a lot of it for for this particular article and obviously the analysis that, that's being done now publicly. Um, you know, you can look increasingly at open sources that are talking about these issues um, in my my latest national interest article, for instance, I, I reference a whole bunch of uh, citations. Some of them are government sources, others are not. Um, but all perf very uh, quite authoritative, talking about different aspects of the challenges that we face and the things that China is doing. Places like the Center for New American Security, my old home, um, uh, Heritage has obviously done great work on it. Rand Corporation just had a, an outstanding report. It's called Inflection Point. It's a long report, but it's worth reading for anyone interested. Um, that goes through this problem set, uh, and that team effort was led by a guy named Dave Achmanek, who is who has just been. Um, he was one of the guys raising the flag on this years ago. So, uh, you know, for, for those who are not in government, don't have access to some of the non-public information, there's still a substantial amount of open source information they can refer to um, to get up to speed and sort of see what's happening. Yeah. So I have links to all those things, including the RAND report. And in fact, in that report, I think is where they said that U.S. defense strategy and posture have become, quote, insolvent. Um, when... When did that do you think that that insolvency occurred? Like, at what point did U.S. perception of its capability in the Pacific and of the ability to deter an invasion of Taiwan um, no longer match up with the reality? When, when, when did that occur? Do you think? Sure. I, actually, you know, I'll answer the question maybe on, on two levels. Uh, first, just speaking to exactly the question you just asked, 
you know, when I when I arrived on the Hill um, in 2019, it was uh, it was um, there was a general awareness that that a fight over China wasn't going to be clean. Right. This is going to be tough. But there was also a general sense of optimism. And when I say there was, I'm talking about folks on the Hill. I'm talking about leadership in the Pentagon. Importantly, I'm also talking about folks out in Hawaii, out in the in the region. I'm talking about not just commanders out there, but but operating forces out there. I think pilots, submariners, others, folks actually doing the uh, the shooting and scooting. Um, it was going to be hard, but 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 we could we could do it. You know. One of the things that that the senator had me do, and, and I found a lot of value, in was just spend as much time sort of going back to a lot of the same folks, you know, a large number of folks, but you know, year after year, and just and try to build almost a longitudinal picture of what's happening, what's changing, and, and how are people feeling about it. And by twenty one, it was clear that something was different. The tone of those conversations had changed dramatically, and there was, you know, um, and and that's that's when I became uh, began to become very concerned. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, I would say in the years since it's, it's, it's only gotten worse in terms of folks's analysis of, of the situation and, and our ability, um, to prevail in it. So I've heard the same thing from contexts of mine that are either in theater or were in theater, but I don't have the ability to, I mean, there's certain information that I'm not allowed to, to be, to be told, um, in these conversations. So I'm curious what do you attribute to that change in feelings since 2021, that change in confidence? I mean, I, I think just as an objective factor, it's it's getting worse. The, the Chinese, you know, say what you will about them, um, say what you will about the CCP. It has demonstrated its ability to keep the eye on the ball and to make progress. Jackie Deal is a, an analyst here, um, I, I believe affiliation is a long-term strategy group. She wrote this um, great article. It got picked up by Politico um, a couple of years back, but basically documenting how uh, Chinese defense spending was still going up even amidst the COVID pandemic with all of the other um, requirements that placed on the Chinese economy. Um, bottom line, even amidst all that, 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 that those challenges and, and, and those um, pressures, they kept investing. They kept moving forward. So are those assessments made primarily based on hardware? Or are there? What is it that? What is it that? Um, what combination of factors for a layperson that's listening to this? Sure. What combination of factors are used to make an assessment, and then to assess degrees of competency, um, relative competency in in an engagement in a battle between U.S. forces and Chinese forces? Sure. So that, so, that would actually so that that would actually impact morale in the course of just a few years. Yeah. So I um. In broad terms, right? You know, on the spending side, it, I would defer to Jackie and some of the other folks who are sort of going through the numbers on on their methodology. But just sort of in broad terms, right? You know, you would imagine you, you can imagine um, that the United States spends a lot of time trying to understand uh, what are the Chinese forces fielding, right? What new hardware do they have? What is the software that that links that hard together? So they've got new ships, they've got new submarines. Are they good? Right? Are they built to spec? Um, can we see how they're operating? Are they operating effectively? Are they making like obvious errors or not? Right? Like, how do they talk to one another? You know, um, and and that's that's sort of on the on the force structure mm. side, right? But at the same time, you'd spend a lot of time looking at the people, right? You know, what does China's C two command and control structure look like? Are they, you know, very much in the Soviet groove where um, you've got one guy twelve levels up who says go, and then it takes you know there's a lag time before people actually start to go, and it's so centralized that they can't fight in a nimble way, or are they devolving control closer to the operational line um, so that their forces actually can adapt and, and respond more effectively to contingencies in the field. Um, you know these are all some of the, the the kinds of questions that you would imagine U.S. government and allies, for that matter, are, are investing quite substantially in um, to try and understand. Uh, both what the Chinese are fielding, um, numbers, type, and the rest, and also just how good they are. Um, and then, you know, I, I believe it was uh, a, a senior U.S. Air Force official said this just this week. I mean, he made the point that the Chinese and the Russians use a variety of of tactics to learn from us in in, in contact, right? So they'll send their 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 jets out. Um, to make intercepts on U.S. aircraft and see how we respond. We'll see, you know, when do they get first get pinged that we've 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 caught them or, or that we've locked onto them. You know, how close they can they get to do, you know, some of the things that they want to do to us, right? There, there's this active learning process 
Um, and you can imagine that that's something that 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 you know we could presumably take advantage of in kind. So there's there's a lot of different ways, but this is essentially it's a learning process, um, and and that drives uh, you know a lot of the assessments of the relative balance uh, between U.S. and Chinese forces in different aspects of uh, a potential war from the undersea to space to the air domain to the surface uh, and, and and so on. So as we're talking, China has launched what by some measures have been called the largest naval exercises yet in the Pacific. Um, what what can you tell us about those naval exercises and what can we learn about them in terms of both uh, Chinese capabilities and Chinese intentions, which is another huge part of this conversation that we haven't even begun to really tap yet? Sure. So, you know, the value of any particular exercise largely depends on what's happening in that exercise. And, and oftentimes that's not going to be publicly reported, right? Because if you're if you're looking, if you're watching that exercise and you're looking at, you know, there are things that are obvious to anyone, you know, who can peg through a satellite or or is nearby. Oh, uh, they have so many ships, here's what they're doing. But there are other things that are not obvious and they won't be obvious. You know, are they talking to each other? How are they coordinating? What exactly, what are they testing that may not be in the in the um that you can't see, whether it's in the electronic domain or otherwise, right? Um, so all to say, what you can learn from any particular exercises is, is largely contingent on what exactly is happening and what you have available um, to 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 um, to watch and learn from it. Now, I think you know what is more telling is the broader trend, um, which is the fact that the People's Liberation Army has uh, steadily increased both the size and sophistication of its exercises with regards to Taiwan specifically now for for many years. That is a, a a durable trend, and it is a very uh, it's a substantial indicator for what it is that they are in fact trying at least to have the ability to do. Uh, Bill Burns and others have since validated publicly that Xi Jinping has directed the PLA to be able to take Taiwan to twenty seven. Doesn't mean obviously that he's said you know go do it in twenty seven. Uh, simply that he By wants twenty twenty seven. Correct. That is correct. Um, the exercise cycles that we're watching clearly point in that direction. These are increasingly realistic exercises um, that are uh, showing that the People's Liberation Army is moving closer to being able to put on an operation of the scale required specifically uh, to seize control of Taiwan. So there's what the Chinese Communist Party says, the documents that uh, it and its affiliated organizations put out, and then there's what the Chinese state apparatus does. Um, based on those two things and anything else, I guess, that you would rely on in order to judge intentions, what do you think the intentions of the leadership in Beijing are at this point? Sure. So I, you know, there's the debate on this has evolved over the years. Once upon a time, there's a very substantial amount of debate over what it is exactly that Xi Jinping and the CCP want. I would say the debate has narrowed a little bit in the last few years, in large part due um, to, uh, I think, some very, very good analysis of exactly the sources that you've just described. Um, you know, based on the sources available, I think we can say confidently that that the Chinese Communist Party seeks hegemony in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, they seek to be to the Indo-Pacific something similar, frankly, to what the United States has been in North America. Um, and you know, subsequent to that, from the Chinese perspective, to to displace the United States as the world's most powerful nation and, and achieve what what has been translated, at least to mean global preeminence, right? Um, these, you know, we can sort of talk through some of the nuances of what these terms mean, but in practical terms for us, you know, it is it is very important from America from an American interest perspective that that China not be allowed to fulfill these hegemonic ambitions. It's not to say we necessarily don't want China to be a prosperous nation. We want China to be able to live with dignity, the Chinese people to live with dignity. It is simply to say that that it would be extremely uh, damaging to American interests were China to be able to achieve, setting aside questions of global preeminence, even just hegemony in the in the Pacific. That that region, as you and your listeners know better than most, um, is already in many ways the heart of the global economy that will continue and, and intensify in the years ahead. Um, and it would be uh, terribly concerning were Beijing to actually have the power to regulate U.S. access to that area, um, to uh, to use market access as leverage to coerce and compel U.S. companies and consumers and, and, and further corrupt American politics uh, to compel nations outside of Asia to disfavor us. I mean, imagine a world where uh, China is hegemon in the Indo-Pacific, where Europeans and, and, and folks in the Middle East are you know, desperate to get access to some of those markets. And as a result, you know, China can use that to drive wedges between us and some of our important partners or allies. Um, and, and the list goes on. I mean, one, one last you know, 
thing that that I mean, it's unfortunately not you know as hypothetical as, as it might once have been. You know, if, if China is able to do in the Indo-Pacific what it seeks, you know, this is not just a, a negative proposition for the United States. This is in many ways a positive proposition for China if it can achieve as a consolidate power on a regional basis to the degree that we understand it, the CCP leaders want to. Um, that could, frankly, provide. Uh, uh, a perfectly strong foundation for for global power projection, similar to what the United States has done. You know, it is not, I think, hyperbole to say that if that happens, um, we could look at a world, frankly, where the PLA and the, the People's Liberation Army Navy operates freely in the Gulf of Mexico, or the PLA has operated in locations in our hemisphere. It's a very different world from when we live in now, the one we've lived in for quite some time. And I don't think it's a world that we want our children or our grandchildren to know. So this might be not a particularly consequential question, or maybe it is, but it's something I formulated in the course of listening to your last answer, which is how much of Chinese intentions do you think are driven by insecurity versus an ambition for power? That's a great question. And and and, and I will sort of just as an opening statement, uh, uh, defer to folks like Rush Doshi. And other sinologists who who may have written a great certain... book on this, the long game that people should listen to. That I think take combines a lot of the type of stuff that we've talked about on this show over the years into one great book. A absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and he himself is is just a phenomenal analyst. Unfortunately, I don't think he's available because he's currently <laughs> with the Biden administration. <laughs> so, I think I suspect I suspect his handlers would have some concerns with that. Yeah. Um, but but no, absolutely great book, great reference. But but I would just say, you know. There's this 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 um, phenomenon in international relations called the security dilemma, right? Um, you, some, so your question sort of alludes to it, right? That states do certain things in, in order to feel more secure and in the process cause another state to feel less secure. And then you get into a cycle of militarization that pushes countries closer to confrontation when all both sides really wanted was simply to feel safe. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would be... Um, I, I I think it is a fair hypothesis to say that there are elements of those kinds of dynamics in the U.S.-China relationship um, today, and, and probably have been for some time, um, to the degree that uh, that that the things that the United States is doing to strengthen deterrence in the region could be perceived by some in Beijing, rightly or wrongly, and, and that's a that's an important distinction, but rightly or wrongly, um, as uh, threatening Chinese interests as they as they define it, right. But that's not exclusive to, to the other part of your question, right? These are not mutually exclusive propositions. I think it is telling that um, for many, many, many years, including while the United States was you know, extremely focused on and invested in the Middle East, with no meaningful attention whatsoever to the Indo-Pacific, China was militarizing. Uh, China has been doing things uh, specifically aligned to the ambitions I described before um, in the military realm, the economic realm, the diplomatic realm. For, for many, 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 many years when nobody could realistically say the United States was doing anything that could credibly pose a serious threat or a real threat at all to Chinese security. I mean, while it was doing this, we were doing everything in our power, it seems, to enable the rise, everything from the WTO um, and onward. So, you know, certainly there may be aspects of, of a security mm -hmm. dilemma type scenario in, in some of the things that are happening today. But I, I don't think, you know, over the course of this competition and, and even today that those are um, – predominant. It seems to me that the, the 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 most consistent motivation that we can observe based on the evidence available is in fact that the CCP wants something in it and it's working towards that. Yeah, it seems that we treated China as though they were they had no global power ambitions, that they would be just some another version of Japan or or um or Germany and would be lulled to sleep by the sweet, sweet benefits of you know global capitalism, it seems to me in the reading of this, and you're much more, um, you're better sort of situated to give an opinion on it. But it seems to me that when it comes to you know insecurity versus ambition, it seems that insecurity drove the party much more in the earlier period after Tiananmen, after the fall of the Soviet Union, which was a traumatic, scary event as well for the party, as well as the um, the first Gulf War and the assessment of American military power. And I guess since, you know, at least 2008, the it seems that um, the leadership in Beijing has become more assertive and confident around its 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 time, right? Like changes. We What's the phrase that Xi Jinping has used and other mm. previous leaders have used? Changes unseen in, in 100 years or so. Um, I had a question here. Let me see what it was. Um, 
so let's let's actually go back to what we were talking about before we got into this question about insecurity versus ambition and Chinese intentions and just wrap up something about Taiwan, which I think is really important. And that has to do with why is Taiwan so important? And I have some some questions about that as well, some follow up questions. But at, at a sort of broad assessment level, why should American people really care about Taiwan one way or the other? It's an island. It's right next to China. You could argue that the Chinese have um, reasons, you know, sort of uh, moral reasons to want to claim uh, ownership or influence over it that the United States doesn't have. We certainly wouldn't feel comfortable with uh, the Chinese trying to protect uh, U.S. takeover of, I don't know, some adjacent island here in the Americas. So why is Taiwan so important? Why should we be freaking out about it? It's a great question and, and frankly, a fair one. Um, it's one I encounter uh, with some regularity here in Washington, and certainly when I'm outside of Washington. The, the short answer is we, we should care about Taiwan in, in, in large measure because we should care about China and what China is doing. Um, I mentioned a moment ago how important it is that that we not allow China uh, to succeed in, in its hegemonic ambitions. A key part of that today, most urgently today, is preventing China from taking Taiwan. And the best way to do that, obviously, is by deterring conflict in the first place. Um, Taiwan matters in this regard for for military reasons, for economic reasons, for and for for diplomatic ones. You know, I, I, on the first point, if China takes control of Taiwan, it does substantially improve its ability to project power uh, in that part of the region. China will have broken through what is called the first island chain. Kind of, if you imagine a map, it swings down from Japan through Taiwan and the Philippines and down and around. Um, you know, Chinese strategists look at that as a fence on their ambitions. That's not entirely wrong. It is. And, and if we want to make sure that China can't fulfill those ambitions, it's important to hold that chain from a military perspective. If they get that, their ability to project power against Japan, Korea, the Philippines goes up. China's ability to access the Western Pacific with U.S. territories, U.S. bases and other things there, it goes up. Um, so from a military perspective, you know, this this would be this would be challenging. It would probably be even harder and more costly to try and, uh, you know, uh, balance China militarily at that point. Economically, obviously, Taiwan is home to a vibrant semiconductor industry and others too. Um, if that industry survived a war or in other, for any reason was taken intact by China, um, China's ability to use economic coercion, not just against us, but against others in Asia and around the world would, would go up tremendously. Um, that would not help us to try to prevent China from being able, again, to consolidate power in the region. And, and that, and both of those factors, I think, point to the to the last one, which is you know, by most metrics, it's obvious the United States is not going to be able to balance power against China to prevent China from achieving regional hegemony on its own. We're just not powerful enough against a statement about the size of our economy, a statement about the size of our military, a variety of things. Um, so this is a coalition effort. The, the simplest way to put this in, in Asia specifically is, is we need folks in the, that region to not yield to China's demands. If folks, if Asian states agree whether they say it or not, to bandwagon with China, to 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 cede um, effective control of that region to China, then the game's over. We don't want that to happen. And important to that um, is making sure that they have confidence that if they do stand firm against Beijing, doing their own part, right? This we can't do it alone. They do. This is going to require investment on their part, but that they can count on the United States to help them in that effort. Um, and there, to try, Taiwan too matters because in many ways, I, you know, this is a phrase that appeared. Uh, in strategy with Nile, and I think it was um, reference to uh, a leader in the region. I forget who it was, but bottom line, you know, I've heard it too. Taiwan is viewed as a canary in the coal mine in many regards. It, we have, rightly or wrongly, it is perceived that we have committed to come to Taiwan's defense. If it is clear that we are not able or willing to do that, um, then it, it may become more difficult to convince other other Asian states to stay on side, and that's something that that we should be concerned about as well. So China does not have easy pickings in Asia. Even if it took over Taiwan, it's surrounded by powerful, uh, geostrategically well-situated countries like India, um, Japan. It it uh, it isn't, in other words, a situation where if it, if they take over Taiwan, they now have free reign. They have long-term challenges. They also have major demographic challenges stemming from the one-child policy. Huge economic challenges. They've they've built their entire uh, they've built an economy and the wealth that they've built almost overnight, and that has led to a lot of malinvestment. That's something that they're going to have to deal with over time. So I guess my my it's my question is, if we aren't in fact prepared to defend 
uh, Taiwan or to come to Taiwan's defense, or if the Taiwanese themselves are not prepared, in which case I don't know if it's even worth, and that's a question to ask, is it even worth trying to help defend Taiwan if the Taiwanese aren't serious about this? And let's have a conversation about whether or not they aren't and how we assess that. But if, if, if that's the case, is it really, um, I guess, is it, what what are the Chinese really able to do if they have these major geostrategic competitors with their own ambitions for power and or their and their ability to to project power? What are they really going to be able to do if they take over Taiwan? So I, you know, you're completely right. The point to the fact that that China does face some serious challenges, and, and there is, um, it's possible that frankly that China will solve this problem for us if, if the Chinese economy collapses or, or suffers. Very, very, very substantial um, setbacks, and, and you know, with political ramifications, you can imagine. Um, then it may well be that 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 China is not is sort of of its own um, of its own accord, just unable to pursue those, those grand ambitions that, that the CCP has set for itself. That would be a, a in some ways, in many important ways, I think, a favorable outcome. Um, but I'm not sure that that's something that we should bet on, right? You know, having talked with a lot of folks who are, who are far deeper on the economic side of this than I am. There seems to be a, a a growing sense that yeah, China's economic growth has slowed, um, and uh, and it may can slow further, um, but that a collapse is probably not coming, right? And you know, given the size of the Chinese economy, even if that growth does slow, it will still be able to invest very substantially, um, you know, not just uh, domestically in its own economy as it sort of manages those those shoals, but but in its military, right? So so bottom line, you know, eat, short of a collapse, China is expected to remain. A, a formidable adversary, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. Now, how formidable, I think, is a fair question. Getting to your your point, um, and I think you know, it remains to be seen. You know, if by any, just from a U.S. perspective, um, in a world where the Chinese econ economic growth slows down, um, and it's not you know uh, as wealthy as um, as it was expected to be in some regards. It even for us, it will still be a very, very significant problem. That's why, from from our standpoint, you know, even if Chinese economic growth slows down, we still have to keep investing very, very heavily for us to have confidence in our ability to deter it. So, you know, if you you know compare that to Japan, you compare that to the Phils or India or, or others, you know, for the foreseeable future, bottom line, China's gonna be powerful enough to pose, I think, a very, very serious um, threat, uh, potentially an overwhelming threat um, to any single one of those nations. Um, and uh, and a challenging one for ourselves. Yeah, I mean the analogy. I didn't explicitly say this, but the analogy here is something something like what Britain attempted to do for many years um, outside of Europe, acting as a kind of offshore balancer. And uh, I just don't, I don't see, I don't hear. And I agree, by the way. I'm not saying that this should this should be our first option, but it doesn't seem to me an all all too bad at first. Again, like as a non, I have no sort of um, expertise on what goes into military planning, but it just seems to me kind of on a very general level that the United States is not in a bad position to play that role given the challenges that China faces, whether or not they um, take over Taiwan. So I have another sure. question. If you go ahead, you want to ask. I, I was just going to say, I, I I don't think you're you're wrong I, I at all. I, I think, you know, two things. One, if we can hold the line of Taiwan, that that is, I think, objectively the best outcome, right? If we can do that at tolerable cost to the United States, that's the best outcome because the you know the cost and the difficulty of of trying to um, balance power against China it, it doesn't get any easier if they if they take the island, right? At that point, we have to reset a defensive line in the first island chain, Japan, the Philippines, in the Western Pacific, and we still have to do the kind of thing we're trying to do now in Taiwan. But the 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 geography of that has changed dramatically, and so have the costs. So if we can do it. It at in Taiwan at tolerable cost, then that really ought to be our goal. You know, the tolerable cost there piece matters, right? Um, that's why you know, you know, from from our perspective, from my perspective, certainly investing now to get deterrence right is so important. It's why it's so important that Taiwanese do their part. And, and to your point, we can talk about that separately. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if we can make it work here, that is by far the favorable outcome, um, regardless of what happens to China internally. Um, if we can't, then you know maybe Chinese collapse will save us. But uh, unfortunately, the trends that we've seen so far, it doesn't say it, it, it's not clear. So we we talked about um, Chinese intentions or perception of Chinese intentions. What is our perception of China's um, 
uh, the risks that Chinese leadership are willing to endure because no one knows the future. And the invasion by Russia of Ukraine is a great example of you can have all the assessments in the world, but then actually once you engage in a war, um, you confront the enemy. And then also there is the evolution on the battlefield that occurs and uh, things change dramatically over time. So what, I mean, what assessments have been made about Beijing's willingness to, and they're sort of, what's the term again in in, um, in game theory? They're risk, lo- not risk loving. or Risk tolerance. Risk tolerance, right. What is their risk tolerance here as far as their willingness to go for it uh, in the face of uncertainty without knowing, no matter how much they've planned or how much they've invested, what the outcome's going to be? It's... um. The short answer is it's hard to tell, right? I, you know, in, in part because just like you know, some of the other things you just described, a, a, an actor, whether it's an individual or an organization's tolerance risk can change over time, um, and we've even seen that I think a little bit in Ukraine. I think what we can say confidently, though, we've seen so far is that um, Xi Jinping and the CCP are, are are investing heavily to buy down risk now, right? They are investing, you know, obviously I said before in, in the quality of their forces. They also are building out those forces. Um, all of these things in different ways hedges against the possibility of failure. You know, if they're in the end, um, you know, our goal is to make sure they never have confidence in their ability to do it. Um, that's becoming harder as an objective factor. Would they go if they're generally confident but but not sure? I, you know, I, I think it really depends, and I think it depends if they think that they can su- achieve their goals any other way. Well, let me ask. Let me tell you why I'm bringing this up also because I think this begins to slowly. Um bring us into a conversation about Ukraine. Now, I mentioned earlier on that in my reading of the history, the the Chinese, the leadership in China seemed to have been driven more by insecurity in the immediate post-war period. And after 2008, as well as the 2016 elections with Donald Trump, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which they perceived, at least initially, the United States to be handling really not very competently, the um, the storming of the Capitol building and the pullout from Afghanistan. I think the perception was at that point that the, that the perception was in Beijing. So the perception among U.S. commentators and al- analysts about Beijing, the perception of the leadership in China, was that America was weak. It was a declining power. It was it was it was just a matter of time, right? And if in fact that was the thinking, and maybe that's no longer the thinking because of the invasion of Ukraine. This is a kind of complex question. But if that was the thinking, then that that brings my, me to the question of, well, why would they risk everything by trying to invade Taiwan if they perceived the U.S. to be basically a lumbering giant that's going to just basically implode? And that's what they're seeing. So that's the first question of like, is that sort of what was do you think that 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 is kind of the perception or was the perception? And in fact, if that's the case, then why would they want to invade or has that perception changed um, as a result of the war in Ukraine, and then do, in fact, they sort of view the world much more along the lines of someone like uh, Hal Brands or Michael Beckley, both of whom have been on the podcast before, who perceive there to be a kind of window of opportunity for for the, for the leadership in Beijing, and they would be motivated by a desire to move now before the demographics get too bad or before the United States and Taiwan have um, advanced the deterrence of the island. My assessment has been that or say twofold. One, that uh, for Xi in particular and, and the CCP broadly, taking control of Taiwan is a is is a top priority. Whether it's linked directly to national rejuvenation, sort of um, the 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 party line, if you will, um, is a slightly separate question. But but that that this is something that has to be done. Obviously, uh, according to Chinese sources and, and Americans and others have validated this. You know, the the preference would be to do it without force. Taiwan's sort of uh, willingly agree to to you know fall under the the CCP's control, um, and if there was a way to your point for that to happen simply by waiting, then I would be surprised if the CCP didn't take it. Um, but that there's no reason to believe that's that can be the case, right? So so we're in a situation now where if you're the CCP and you've made uh, acquiring Taiwan a top priority that has to be done, um, you probably have come to the conclusion that it's going to take force at some point. The question then becomes, well, when's the best time to do it? Um, this gets to your, your decline question. If it were true that the CCP um, could bet on the United States eventually sort of, sort of falling off and imploding of our own accord, um, basically leaving Taiwan totally defenseless, then it would make sense for them to wait as long as that took 
and then sort of make good on on their goals, setting aside that you know there may be a she may have a political time or whatever, but just in broad terms, right? Um, I it, but that just does not seem to be uh, the case. You know, the it's not that the United States obviously doesn't have problems, and China doesn't see that, but the U.S. Um, has spent a long time neglecting the Pacific. Uh, and at some point, that will probably change. Hal and, and Michael obviously you know, spoke to you about some of the economic challenges and how that factors into win of opportunity considerations. U.S. military modernization is a consideration too. Um, to the last part of your question, right? Like at some point, we're going to get these things right. It may be five, ten, fifteen years late, but at some point, it will happen. And at that point, it will it will only get harder for China to do what it is set out to do. So I think basically that the, there is a a window of opportunity problem here, probably. Um, and then at some point, Beijing will realize that that it has achieved its maximum re advantage relative to the United States and Taiwan. And it will after that point, it will only become harder and costlier for them to take it. Um, and uh, and so you know for that reason, uh, sort of underneath everything else, um, it does seem like this is a conflict that will likely happen. Um, it's more a question of, of of when than it is a question of whether. So to your point about having neglected the Pacific. When so is the issue that because the attitude has changed in Washington, um, is the issue is the is the issue primarily that it isn't enough of a priority still, or is it that we're just not moving fast enough in making that pivot? How do you assess it? I, I would say both. We're not moving fast enough, and we're not moving fast enough because it's not a priority. So w w one quick interjection there. Here's a question. So there's always a, a discrepancy between what military planners think they need and what the civilian leadership thinks is required. So it, accounting for that sort of constant discrepancy, how far is the gulf between what people in theater and people that are in charge of actually winning a conflict with China are saying and thinking and asking for and, and what the perception is in Washington? So just this year, I mean, the administration's uh, the budget request for DOD left three three and a half billion dollars in unfunded priorities for Indo Paycom. Um, you know, you could go through. Uh, I'm not sure if it's publicly available, but you could imagine going through a list of the things on that list from Indo Paycom and say, oh, okay, this is not that important. This is not that important. Cool about some of the other ones, but as a general matter, you know, at least in my experience, those those are valid valid requirements, right? And some are you know may well be debatable, but the crux of it is is is, is good stuff. Um, and you know, and there's also there's like a risk. There's a risk management calculus to this here too, right? You know, the margins are really thin in the Pacific. So you know, this is a time when we should, you know, it, it's it's penny wise pound foolish. You know, we can debate whether A, B, and C are all actually required to 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 get after to deter China. Fact is, it's hard to have absolute certainty about that. Um, and what we do know is the margins are so thin as it is that really we should be trying to do as much as possible to buy down that risk. Similar to what China's doing on the other side of the equation. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, a concrete example from this year of how there is, to your point, a substantial gulf, um, and there really shouldn't be. And, you know, it's not to say we should fund, you know, anything that Indopaycom asks for or things that just sort of pulled out of the sky that make no sense. But if it's a validated requirement, if it makes sense, if it could work, if it could realistically help, um, then we should be funding it and moving with with urgency. Maybe just the last thing I would say here is that, there, you know, the funny thing is a lot of the things that are, are needed out in the Pacific are not really – contentious issues, right? There, There's bipartisan agreement. There's agreement between the executive branch, the legislature, different parts of the executive on things like improving our posture, the distributing US forces in the Pacific so that China can't kill them all in one place, right? There's there's agreement on the need, thankfully now, for for munitions, for for deeper stockpiles and certain other things. And yet, you know, even in some of these areas, we're still we're still lagging. Um and uh and substantial because we're just not making those, we're not prioritizing making those investments. So how long, based on how we're moving currently, will it take to, quote, close that window of opportunity for the Chinese? What needs to be done in order to close it faster? How much sooner can we close it? And why are those things not being done? So those are four separate questions, and we can I can repeat them for you, but take whichever one you want first, because I think they all kind of go together here. And they're gotcha. all under the bucket of what does the United States need to do in order to deter a Chinese invasion? Copy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to hit so all when, four. When, so when I... when is when will it, that window close based on what we're doing currently and the pace we're going yep. at? What do we need to do in order to close it sooner? Why have those things not been done? Um, 
and uh, what and yeah, I missed one of them, but <laughs> hey, no, that that works. So I, you know, the first question: of How long? Look, nobody can say exactly when China will be able to or know that it is able to. Right? I would assess that we are in a place today where it's plausible that China may be able to, and that Chinese leaders leaders may believe they're able to. So we're already in a period of danger, right? Like the, we're 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 in it for all intents and purposes. So the 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 task for us is to work as quickly as possible to fix that. Um, you know, in terms of concrete things, and I wrote about some of this in the national interest. Um, you know, I mentioned posture a moment ago. Uh, it's not news that, you know, U.S. forces are still concentrated in relatively large bases, a few very relatively large bases in the Western Pacific. What this means is it's much easier for China to, to hit those forces on the ground, um, to, to, to hit runways and do other things to make it harder for us to feel them and keep in the fight. Um, we've got to disperse that. We want to disperse them to more locations in places like Japan, the Philippines, Guam, the Northern Mariana. So it also depends on them and their willingness to absorb some of those forces. Yeah, certainly in Japan and the Philippines, uh, Guam and Northern Marianas, not so much as the U.S. territories. Um, but uh, but but all these things have to happen. We've made some progress, but not nearly as much as we could have. I, I spent a lot of time out in uh, Guam and the Marianas over the last few years, uh, especially Guam. Um, and, and in those places, it's just it's incredible just how many self-imposed delays there are. So this is an example of something everyone agrees we need to do. We're not doing it fast enough hardening, right? Putting aircraft shelters out, putting... Um, you know, uh, more munition stores, fuel bladders, other things out so that we can operate from these uh, dispersed locations and so that China can sort of take out key supplies all at once, right? Um, these are other things that that go with dispersal. We're also behind the ball there too. Incidentally, China is doing a lot of this in its own mainland. We are not doing it in the Western Pacific. There are other things, right? Where it is not news. Ukraine made this, frankly, did help to convince people that we need to do this. But it's not news that we need a deeper munition stockpile, especially for precision guided munitions for Western Pacific conflict. Um, we don't have them. The CSIS, I think it was, published a report earlier this yes. year, basically showing how we run low for a matter of days. That's terrible. This is not news. This is a problem that we could have fixed. We have to fix it now as quickly as possible. There are other ones too. You know, I, um, you know, in terms of force structure, right? Uh, being able to have ships, submarines, aircraft, uh, certain like ground-based long-range fires, think like guys with missiles sort of scooting around and then shooting at Chinese ships on the ground, off from the ground. Um, these are the kinds of capabilities that, that we're going to need a lot of in the Pacific. And if we can have more of them forward in certain places in peacetime, it will help to convince the Chinese that it's going to be harder to, to mount an invasion, right? So, you know, we should, uh, we can move some of those capabilities from other regions into the Pacific so that they're already there. Um, instead of retiring some ships, you know, we can keep them in service, right? This all costs money, but it all contributes to our ability to achieve deterrence by denial, like I mentioned before. I Two other things I'll just mention, there, there's there's certainly more. Um, Commander of U.S. and the Pacific Command said publicly just a few days ago, he talked about this um, targeting effort. Basically, he wants to be able to keep eyes on, I think he said, a thousand Chinese targets in real time at all times so that if the flag goes up, you know, we know where they are and we can go after them quickly instead of having to lose time trying to find them. That's a huge, huge, huge effort, something that is going to take a lot of resources, um, but can make a big difference. And the last thing I would say is um, is arming the Taiwanese themselves, right? You know, when we think about beating an invasion, a lot of that, will, it, the front line is Taiwan. If they can fight effectively, if they can um, delay and, and destroy large enough numbers of those Chinese air and sea assets in particular, not only does that save American lives, frankly, because there's fewer Chinese forces to go after us or that we need to go after, um, but it will be it will be absolutely vital to ultimately holding off that invasion and sort of by extension helping to deter it in the first place. So that's a it's a relatively short list. There's more to it, but those are some of the sort of core lines of effort. And they all take resourcing. They all trade against other priorities. That's why if we're gonna do it, if we're gonna move as fast as possible, this has to be the priority. So I have the link to the CIS paper. I think the one that you're citing is the empty bins in a wartime environment, the challenge to US to the US industrial base, which is something that we're going to talk about in the second hour. Um, that, as well as many other links, are available in the uh, intelligence report to this episode. So I definitely recommend people check that out. I'm going to ask you one more question, Alex, and then we're going to move it to the second hour. And that question has to do with something you just said before, which is that e even easy things aren't being done. Um, why are those easy things not being done? Is it just organizational inertia, bureaucracy? Is that it? And why you know, can't why can't it why can't executive orders 
um, you know, push that the pace of that forward? It, it's a uh, that's the that's the question of the day, and I, and I think the answer is is certainly multifaceted. Um, I put it this way: you can imagine easily imagine a world where if you had a president and a secretary of defense that said, "Move heaven and earth to do this," then heaven and earth would be moving. Right, that the administration's We've seen request, that before in the United States. Right, you, and and you would see the administration's request would not come over with three and a half billion dollars missing from Indo Paycom's you know goal sheet. You you would not, you know, we would not have to be fighting right now to 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 send money and weapons um to Taiwan itself so it can defend itself and and save our force. Right, we wouldn't be having those kinds of fights. I mean, certainly Congress would still have its say. Congress ultimately holds the purse strings. Um, oftentimes Congress will defer to the administration on a lot of this stuff. You know, they'll take puts and cuts here and there. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, if, if the administration made this priority, I think you'd see a lot more of that and then we can have the congressional fight. But, um, but I think that is kind of, it, it, it is a, uh, it, it's going to be absolutely necessary. The administration will not clearly prioritize this. Congress will, will, will not be able, I think, to pick up, um, the bag altogether. So I said, um, that there are a number of topics I want to talk about in the second hour. One of them is the, is the defense industrial base. And in general, America's industrial capacity, because we have this thought in our head, we have this um, construct, which is freedom, Freedom's Forge and America's uh, um, experience uh, in World War II and the way we ramped up and became the arsenal of democracy. And America's economy is very different today. And people will be shocked by some of the assessments. I mean, some of the stuff I've seen, I think, in fact, it was this uh, recent CS, CSIS report that uh, that showed that even for certain critical munitions, certain maybe um, long range missiles, I don't remember what it was, even those, some of those would run out, uh, we would run out of those munitions within a week of, an, of a Taiwanese invasion, of an invasion of Taiwan. So it's, it's, it's rather remarkable, actually, I must say, when you actually sit to look at what the state, uh, what the, uh, the readiness of our industrial base is and, and our stockpiles are, to see really what condition we're in. It's not one that's very encouraging, which is why another thing that I want to talk to you about in the second hour is prioritizations. So we're spending an enormous amount of money and attention on the war over Ukraine. You, Elbridge, and others have made the argument that we need to focus our priority in Taiwan. And when it comes to having to choose between the two, we have to choose the latter. And that I want to understand that argument better, and I want to understand what the costs are associated with that um, that argument. I also um, want to understand your perception of the Taiwanese people's commitment to fighting a protracted conflict. I've looked at some some recent polls and listened to some analysts who are Taiwanese and kind of study the the country, and it sounds to me like there is a a pretty profound disconnect in Taiwan relative to at least what um policy what what analysts like you are saying um and maybe even some magical thinking that resembles much more what was going on in um in pre-world war 2 uh, pre-world war 1 France than what was actually happening what was actually ha occurring in Ukraine ahead of Russia's invasion um, and so that really comes that, that has to do with, you know, the capacity of the Taiwanese to defend themselves and whether they're they are they are a country and a people that we can invest in in the way that the United States has been able to invest in Ukraine. Those are just some of my thoughts. And also, of course, a conversation about grand strategy, which is ultimately something that I think the American people have to be on board with and understand in order for the U.S. to be successful in anything it does, because this is a democracy for anyone who is new to the program. Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Alex, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Alex, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed.